to begin, um, I want to welcome everyone to this panel. This is for the OECD side session for the Textile and Garment uh, Forum that is uh, being held uh, virtually this year again. Um, let's hope that next year we will all be able to meet again. Um, so for today, we have um, a real uh, distinguished panel of speakers. Um, we have uh, Kalpona Akter, who is from the BGIWF uh, president, and she's also a member of the Industrial Executive Board. We're also joined uh, by Jason Judd from the Cornell I School of International Labor Relations New Conversation Project. Um, we have Liz Ulmas, who is a senior advisor to Industrial on Capital Strategies. And we will also be joined by Ruin from the International Transportation Transport Federation. Sorry about that. Um, as many of you know, Industrial Global Union and its affiliates have been working uh, quite diligently to move from uh, voluntary initiatives to binding uh, global initiatives uh, to better the sector, uh, the abuses, the work, uh, worker abuses in the sector. And we really saw that uh, in the COVID pandemic um, where supply chains broke down and uh, most workers bore the brunt of the uh, supply chain uh, breakdown. Um, there were order cancellations and we rallied against them and uh, turned the industry for many brands around to ensure that they paid for orders that they had placed. But it was very clear from the pandemic that the uh, supply chain and the lack of social protection and the safety net for workers uh, were real, were, were laid bare. And I think that's uh, the beginning of the work that industrial uh, and its affiliates started on to examine how we can move towards um, taking these uh, strides that we've made around binding uh, uh, agreements with global brands and how to see that, that they can be used in uh, to solve other systemic problems. And I'm going to um, turn first to Kalpona and maybe for us to start the conversation with Kalpona. Um, Kalpona is a trade union leader uh, and a member of Industrial's Global Executive Board What's the significance for you as a worker and a leader of the newly negotiated International Accord for Health and Safety in the textile and garment industry? This is the successor agreement to the Bangladesh Accord. Yeah. Kalpona? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. And hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this important panel today. Um, so what is the significance? First of all, you know, the congratulations to our Industrial Global Union for being able to negotiate this phenomenal agreement once again, which is uh, beyond Bangladesh now. It is international. So Accord was always a place for the workers here in the ground in Bangladesh. Like when we lost the workers in uh, Rana Plaza, that if preventable you know, catastrophe in back 2013, we had to pressure this brand to sign this accord on Bangladesh Fire and Building Safety, safety which was a binding agreement. And in apparel industry, of course, it was new. And last eight years, the court has made a phenomenal change here in the country uh, where, you know, 1,600 factories are in a, in a safe, uh, we can say they are in a safer, they are a safer place while 2.2 million workers can work uh, without a fear in those factories. So when we have that, in the same time, we have it here, you know, fear that whether it will be going forward or not, then we have had this success that we were able to negotiate these. And now it is not uh, in a only frame of fire, electrical and structural, it is way beyond. Now it, the code will be cover the whole occupational safety and health. So which is a great, great achievement that we have achieved. So the Bangladesh part, of course, it will be st is still there. It is intact. Um, top of that, there is a special clause has been added that, uh, you know, when workers make a complaint through the accord complaint mechanism, uh, third party will be not, uh, you know, intervene on that. And that third party is, you can be union as well, which is fine because we have seen a lot of intervention 
from the manufacturers in, in uh, whenever work has tried to complain. And one more thing that we achieved that a code will be uh, working one, uh, you know, one more country. And we, we really don't know yet that which country it could be, but that can be you know, Pakistan because we are seeing a lot of accident there and those need to be prevented. So, you know, I wanted to sum that we really achieved a great document and still it is um, binding. And though there is a clause added, which is still not been, uh, you know, not, uh, not uh, under the binding provision though, it will be including the human rights due, due diligence. So still the working committee speaking, I mean, talking on that, hopefully we'll be achieving this. So for us, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of last year, it was a great achievement. And we really look forward to work one more country with their code and make difference. Over to you, Christina. Thanks, but maybe just one quick follow-up. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we've been working on in industrial recently has been around the impact of COVID. Can you speak a little bit to uh, how workers in Bangladesh have uh, been impacted by COVID? Sure, thank you. So, you know, the COVID, when we talk about COVID, uh, no doubt it is it is a very practical thing for uh, people around the world. But when we talk about the workers in production country, the situation really dire. So last year in March, I think during this time, when our, when our country went to lockdown, and uh, I think beginning of March, we started facing the uh, the picorious, I mean, he started watching the picorious side of the business model that brand was started canceling the order or postponing or denying to the pay the bill to the manufacturers, which has directly impacted our workers that manufacturers said getting no bills means they cannot pay the workers. And workers, when they do not get pay, they will be literally starving because the country we are in, we don't have social protection. We don't have a social security for the citizens. And we don't have any unemployment insurance. And historically, we are ended up with the poverty wages in here. So workers never had a chance to uh, save the money to, you know, uh, to, uh, to use those, you know, during this kind of emergency. So the impact was over three, 300,000 workers lost their job and majority of them are women. So uh, any disaster you see, the most first impacted goes to uh, women and children. So these women and children went to the ground zero and they were starving their home for I think one and a half year until they, they were able to come back to the industry. Thousands of workers did not pay their wages and let alone the severance pay. So the impact was really hard and we are still dealing with these and I think, you know, you know, when I will get a scope, we will be talking about that, how, you know, within industrial, we are trying to uh, resolve those uh, issues to bring the transnational companies in a negotiating table to pay the un unpaid wages. Thanks, Kalpana. Yes, that's right. You know, when the COVID uh, hit and we saw the impact um, across the globe, across the supply chain in production countries with a lack of social protection, and only relying on severance, which is very hard to, if an employer isn't going to pay it, uh, it's very hard to recoup it. So we, uh, one of the things that we did, and I'm gonna turn to Jason, cause this is a nice segue, is that we in Industrial and our affiliates, we commissioned a paper, uh, a research paper from Cornell um, to look at you know, security for apparel workers um, and to look at different models, how can we go forward um, in negotiating with global brands and suppliers on this very fundamental question around the social safety net? So I'm going to ask Jason, maybe if you could just give a few uh, findings of the research paper and how you've uh, looked at that question for us. Jason? Sure. Thanks, Christina. So I, I thought I'd, I'd pull from the, the paper which we're, we're about to publish, uh, a, few of the, uh, a few of the graphs to help illustrate uh, the problem that Kalpona and, and Christina are talking about. Let me share my screen. Um, so there's a picture of the paper. We're hoping that we'll publish it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but here's where we go in the paper. At, uh, at Industrial's invitation, we, we, looked at, we looked at existing models for, uh, for severance. And in the paper, we run through all of the all of the major 
examples and compare them with one another. At the end, uh, we come up with what we call a, a, a model global severance program, the elements that we believe a global severance program must, uh, must include. This request from Industrial fits with, fits with uh, our, our, our project's purpose. We at Cornell University and the labor school study uh, what, happens, uh, what happens to workers, suppliers, buyers, uh, along global supply chains. Um, so the, the, the darkest, some of the darkest months of the COVID crisis uh, were, uh, were, uh, were useful in that we could, we could take a look at, at models uh, to help reduce the precarity of uh, garment workers, assuming that uh, bad as COVID is, it's not, the, it's, not, it's not the last crisis the industry will, will face. So we looked first at, uh, we looked first at the, the, uh, the scope. We had to narrow the scope uh, recognizing that apparel is produced all over the world, 45 or 50 countries are producing apparel for export to major markets like the EU and the US. So we looked at where apparel is coming from, and we would focus on those, on those countries in analyzing and developing this model. In this graph and the next one, you'll see where the, the vast majority, 80 plus percent of all exports, apparel and footwear exports to the US and the European Union come from predominantly China still uh, but these top 10 these top 10 countries represented in these two graphs account for um, almost all of apparel exports this is the US and this is Europe you'll see little changes uh, in the US more more Vietnam no Turkey um, less Bangladesh in the European be more Bangladesh but but um, that big red swath through the middle is largely unchanged. That's China's one third share of export. Uh, and then we had a look at, uh, given, given, given that scope, this list of, of a dozen or so countries where most of apparel and footwear exports come from, we looked at uh, what they do on the employment and severance front. What are the obligations on employers? What sort of systems exist? What sort of social protections exist for workers in the apparel sector? And as you can see in this table, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's some variation in terms of unemployment and social protection systems. Um, most countries have, but many of them don't. Uh, and as, and with regard to severance, all the countries in this study have a severance uh, requirement. But as Kalpona said, a government can require that employers pay severance, but if there's no enforcement, then it's effectively meaningless. Um, we recognized at the top of the paper that the first best solution to this problem is uh, effective, uh, well-funded, democratically administered unemployment or social protection systems plus severance. That's the, that's the gold standard. But we recognized also at the top of the paper that most of the countries in this study don't provide that uh, for apparel workers or, or any others. And that the building of those systems takes a long time. The ILO works uh, assiduously with national governments, unions, employers to build these systems, but uh, it's a slow boat. So in the absence of that, what are the, what are the models? Well, the first one uh, at one end of the spectrum is the, is the private regulation code of conduct. These are the, the voluntary codes that, uh, that, that, that buyers, apparel uh, buyers, retailers, uh, write for themselves, administer for themselves, measure progress by themselves. And in our shop, the other half of our new conversations project, uh, Sarosh Kurovila has written a book about uh, the impact of private regulations. Uh, it's, it's, it's progress, it's shortcomings. And in this graph from the book, you'll see that dotted red line represents the number of, of average violations of codes of conduct. And that would include uh, severance payments to workers when factories close or workers are laid off. Uh, moves a little over time. That is the number of violations uh, per audit go up and they go down over this seven year period. But on the whole, they're not, they're not declining, which is what you'd expect if these voluntary private regulation systems are working. And in the aggregate, they're not. So codes of conduct, despite language about severance requirements, are no guarantee that workers are gonna get what they're owed. There are exceptions. We looked at better work data where there's an intensive uh, program designed to assess labor compliance, including severance at the factory level, some, some measure of accountability, some disclosure of findings, the rates get a little better. But you still see in this five country study uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia where the better work programs uh, are, are extensive. 
and have been in place for years, that the percentage of workers who don't get severance pay uh, is, is high. It's a quarter in Cambodia and up to a third in Vietnam. So recognizing that, that private regulation uh, wasn't going to get workers there and historically hasn't delivered, we looked at all the other, all the other extant models and we, we placed them along these two axes. We looked at these models in terms of their, uh, their, uh, their applicability. Is it, a, is it a one factory scheme? Is it a countrywide scheme? Is it a global or international scheme? And we looked too at how stringent they were. Is it a voluntary scheme or is there a clear obligation for, uh, for employers, for governments to uh, deliver for workers to help them maintain income security when, when bad things happen. And in the paper, we run through each of these. Uh, we start in the, in the bottom left corner there, looking at one factory agreements where a factory closes, maybe the employer closes overnight and dashes out of the country. Somebody has to help make workers whole. And sometimes those lead to severance agreements between unions and buyers. There have been a handful of these over the last 15 years, but uh, those deals often don't make workers whole and many other factories with uh, where the employer, the owner has cut and run, workers go uncompensated. Uh, we look too at uh, the, the Bangladesh Accord, which Kalpona talked about, which is, uh, moves along the spectrum because it's binding on the parties and it has many elements that you'd want in a global uh, or international uh, agreement. But in the original iteration, specific to one country, the new international accord expands that. If you move along the spectrum a little further, in the upper right corner, you get the IBF, uh, the, the International Bargaining Forum Seafarers Agreement that I think Ruan's going to talk about. But that's the, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, global bargaining or international bargaining between, between unions, employers, and, and lead firms, that's the, that's the gold standard. So in the paper, we, we break down the elements of these different models and, uh, and their evolution over time, and then abstract what we think uh, is, is most important in, in these agreements. And uh, here, as an example from the paper, are the elements of the, of the IBF Seafarers Agreement it includes elements, too, of the Bangladesh or the International Accord. These are things that a global severance program, we think, would have to have. And I've highlighted there the big ones. It has to be, obviously, transnational in scope. Uh, there has to be a, a detailed global framework that makes clear how the, how the system is to function and then has, has room for national or com company-level uh, agreements that follow the global framework. Uh, there has to be Perhaps most importantly, it have to be binding obligations on the lead firms. And in apparel, that means uh, global brands and retailers. They have to be legally bound in the agreement um, as they are in the accord. Uh, there should be a, a setting of compensation levels, uh, typically formulas instead of, instead of raw figures. That's important. There has to be a dispute resolution process so that complaints about the way it's working um, can be resolved quickly affordably. Uh, and importantly, in the IBF system, uh, and Ruan will talk about this, I think there is, there is a provision for inspection by the, uh, by the ITF of, of, uh, of sea freight vessels. And you would expect to see that in a, in a global severance fund so that unions and other interested parties can see, see what's happening and help hold all parties accountable. Um, you'll see all of this in the paper. I'm, I'm dashing through it, but when the paper's published, you'll be able to uh, read this at your leisure. The other thing that we, we, we cover in the paper um, are some of the technical aspects. Um, who are the beneficiaries and which countries would be covered by a, a global severance? What's the, what's the benefit? What's the, what's the formula? Um, how does it vary country to country? Um, how is it funded? That's an important question. Uh, how is it delivered? Uh, through employers, through governments, through some, some other intermediary body? How should it be governed? Who makes up the governance of the project? Um, and then those are sort of, those are important technical questions um, that over the last 25 years, we've largely answered in these different iterations of bargaining models. We've, we've figured out how to answer these largely technical questions. They're not easy, but they're not as difficult as that last question. In apparel, who are the counterparties? So in the, in, the, in the seafarers agreement, it's the vessel owners 
and, uh, and the ITF and their member unions. They, they reach an agreement. In apparel, it's not clear who the counterparties are. The global buyers, the brands and retailers are not organized in the way that, uh, that the uh, sea freight vessel owners are. So that's one question. With whom would, would uh, industrial member unions, for example, bargain? And secondly, where's the leverage? In Rana Plaza, the leverage for that agreement, the initial leverage came from the, the unspeakable tragedy at Rana Plaza in expanding an agreement or building a global or international uh, severance fund. Where's the leverage as the, the heat from the, the COVID crisis, for example, dissipates? So a mix of technical and, and, uh, and political or, or power questions to be answered as industrial figures out what a uh, what a global, what a global fund, what a global bargaining uh, model might look like. Sorry, Christina, that was fast, but that's the gist. No, I think it was good, and it also, you know, gives interest for uh, participants in this webinar to uh, look forward to the publishing of the paper. Um, I think also it's important that you know when we looked at severance, we also think of this as a way to build towards. Um, social protection, right? Because, you know, there is a lack um, of that uh, in production countries. But I really want to turn to Ruin now. And um, since you were labeled the gold standard, you know, we want in, for this sector to get to the gold standard for workers who work in the apparel and footwear sector. So I just wanted to turn to you and maybe if you could give us uh, a few brief uh, understanding on how the international um, uh, bargaining forum is set up and, and what have been the benefits for workers in the sector? Yeah, thanks very much, Christina. Uh, good day to all. Um, yes, so, so I think um, what's really interesting about the, um, the ITF seafarers agreement to the International Bargaining Forum is that, of course, we deal predominantly with seafarers who are mobile workers, who come from the global labor pool and ply their trade uh, across the world um, in international waters. And I think what's, um, I think it's important to point at the outset is that, you know, this, all of this began uh, through a system where um, ship owners would um, flag out their vessels. Basically, uh, this is through a system called flags of convenience, where a ship flies the flag of another country other than that of its beneficial ownership. Right. And this has basically meant that um, ship owners can take advantage of really minimal regulation, cheap registration fees, paying little or no taxes and the ability to access this global labor pool. And we're talking about workers coming. The majority of the world's 1.6 million seafarers coming from China, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Right. And what's Interesting there is, of course, they've got access to the, to the global labor pool, but it's also a form of exploiting workers from predominantly global South countries. So immediately we can see the parallels with the garment and footwear industry, I think, if we look at the global supply chain model of production in garments and footwear and um, really seeing this race to the bottoms in terms of wages and standards with a lot of these brands um, investing or having suppliers in countries, as you know, Kalpana was saying earlier, with very poor um, social protection, lax labor laws, or lack of enforcement for various reasons, with a lot of these suppliers being undercapitalized and judgment proof, and the brands being able to hide behind this web of contracts, which is precisely what we face in the shipping sector. So the similarities are certainly there. So the ITF um, for the past 74 years has had a political campaign to uh, seek the, um, the end of these flags of convenience system. But I think we soon understood that, you know, while it's a very good political campaign and we keep fighting for it, that it wasn't gonna change anytime soon. So the second best option was then to have an industrial perspective, that is to see how we can protect and enhance the conditions of employment of seafarers coming predominantly from the global south, um, through a system of coordinated collective bargaining. So the ITF began a system of entering into collective agreements with national level um, employers over the uh, course of the past um, uh, few decades. And then in the late 1990s, we set up what's now called the International Bargaining Forum, Christina and, and Jason, which you, you alluded to. 
Now, the bargaining forum is unique in that I think um, it probably, no, in, in fact, it does represent the only example of collective bargaining at the global level to date. So on the one side, you have the ITF and our maritime affiliates. And on the other, you've got um, basically international maritime employers made up of the International Maritime Employers Council representing European and international maritime employers, the Japanese maritime employers and the Korean uh, maritime employers representing the largest um, um, group of um, maritime employers in the world. And when we get together, we call that the Joint Negotiating Forum, the JNG. So what happens is every two years, the JNG get together and we negotiate what's called an IBF framework agreement. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get to some of the key elements in that agreement in a little bit. But I think what's also very interesting here is that the IBF framework agreement sits right at the top of this sort of um, ladder. And then once that's negotiated, you have local negotiations taking place at the national or company level, which is conducted by the members of the employer associations and our affiliates but always on the understanding that you cannot go below what's negotiated at the global level um, at that framework. Um, and this happens every two years and sometimes agreements are negotiated for um, a longer period covering individual vessels. So you could say individual workplaces or entire fleets of vessels. So these are multiple uh, vessels. Now, um, in terms of the standards covered by the global IBF framework agreement, I think it's, it's pretty much similar to any national uh, or enterprise level CBA that you'd be familiar with. So we cover social elements, professional elements and financial elements. One of the key things is setting a global minimum wage, uh, which um, interestingly, the, at the ILO level, we also negotiate the world's only globally negotiated minimum wage and the collective bargaining process builds on that minimum. So as Jason said, there are some very, very complex formulas and it's, I'm not going to say it's easy at all to reach um, consensus with employers on this, but we have these wage structures and the minimum standards extend to everything from leave entitlement to compensation for death, injury and disability repatriation, medical treatment, parental and maternity leave. And um, I think a key part here is that the, um, uh, the um, employers pay into what's called, what we, what we call the welfare fund, which is a fund dedicated to the um, pastoral and welfare of seafarers. And through that fund, um, the ITF inspectorate, so these are maritime inspectors across 130 ports around the world, um, get to police these agreements. And, and also they also inspect vessels that are not covered by agreements to ensure that the standards in these, um, um, in these agreements are met. So um, fundamentally um, what happens is um, that uh, through our inspectorate, they make sure that these agreements are um, complied with, and they also ensure that they guarantee fair competition for those um, companies that are part of this process by inspecting vessels that are also not covered. And in fact, year on year, uh, and this is actually a shocking statistic, our inspectors collect over 50 million US dollars in owed back pay to seafarers annually. I mean, that's how horrific this industry is. So by engaging on these multiple levels, we think um, that through this system of global collective bargaining, we manage to um, secure decent work for seafarers, but also uh, guarantee fair competition for ship owners who, who certainly want to do the right thing. Um, I think those are, those are, I would say, the main elements. And perhaps just quickly in this, um, at, at this first shot to touch on something that Jason um, highlighted about, you know, who the negotiating parties can be for any model that in industrial wants to adopt. What's really interesting is that Maersk, which is a, a, a major Danish shipping company, they of course have their own vessels, but they also charter vessels, right? So that is they hire other shipping companies to, um, uh, to uh, uh, carry their cargo. 
in 2016, Maersk signed an agreement with the ITF saying that they would make it a requirement that any vessels that it charters has an ITF agreement, thereby um, making it very clear that Maersk as a cargo owner or as a lead firm, as it were, were directly making sure that um, uh, any cargo that, that um, is, uh, is on its books is carried by a uh, vessel with an ITF agreement. Similarly, we have the, maj the oil majors, for example, making similar requirements of their charters. And as we see the human rights due diligence process you know, hit the statute books, we're also seeing a number of companies and brands um, asking their transport suppliers that vessels be covered by ITF agreements. So that brings into play the lead firms, economic employers, and the actual employer um, uh, and, and brings them to, um, to the party as it were. Thanks. No, oh, thanks. I think that's a very interesting. And I think it was interesting, you know, when Jason did the, when Cornell did the research that came out as this, uh, you know, the globe, a way to move, you know, we've at industrial, we've made to the, the next level to the international accord on health and safety, but how do you capture now this next level? And I think, you know, you rightfully identified that, you know, there's systematic problems in this flags of convenience, which we have in the garment industry, but there's also a way to, if you have the political will and the lead firms behind it, here being global brands and retailers, you do have the ability to get a negotiated agreement. And as trade unions, we, you know, all of us here are saying, that's the way to fix the supply chain. You have your due diligence. I mean, even in the OECD uh, due diligence forum, uh, in the guidelines, it, it is quite clear that it says a brand's due diligence is to work with trade unions, pool their leverage, get negotiated agreements to fulfill those requirements. So I think there's a lot of similarities. And, you know, I think when we, you were all both on the supply chain, right? You mentioned Merck, they carry lots of our <laughs> products that are made in Bangladesh by garment workers across the world. So there is definitely a model. And I think we're moving forward to seeing how we can uh, do that, how we can make that model a reality and for garment workers in the, in the sector. Um, I just want to now turn to Liz, and this is a little bit kind of a shift is, um, you know, Liz is our uh, uh, senior advisor for um, capital strategies, but we see more and more um, investors uh, interested in the ESGs. And I wanted to ask Liz if she could maybe talk about how investors uh, fit into this picture of industrial relations that we're working on uh, making as a, a model for the sector. Liz? Sure, thanks, Christina. So uh, yes, investors are an increasingly important lever on companies whose shares they hold. And they are, as, as Christina pointed to, they're increasingly stepping up on human rights issues. And more specifically, a number of institutional investors have already focused for many years on the question of supply chain labor rights. Uh, in particular, uh, there have been a number of investor public statements um, over the years urging companies to support the Bangladesh Accord. And in those statements, the investors, um, th their, their language indicates that they value this new model of industrial relations and that they value strong agreements between trade unions and brands, which I think is a really interesting and encouraging starting point. Um, for example, last year, in their support for the Bangladesh Accord, over 180 institutional investors representing over $4 trillion of assets under management explicitly pointed in a public statement to the binding nature of the agreement as crucial to the model's success in holding brands accountable. And the signatories of that letter expressed a desire to see what they call the proven model of the Bangladesh Accord expanded to other countries in the wake of COVID-19. Um, more generally, I would say investors have shown that they recognize brands' responsibility to ensure uh, supply chain worker rights are, are respected. In terms of the theme of transformation, uh, the Bangladesh Investor Initiative explicitly pushed multinational brands to be quote, directly involved in helping transform the apparel sector in Bangladesh 
by joining the accord. So we've already got these pieces here. I would say that beyond the human rights case for the model, which is really strong, and that is that companies have uh, both ethical and legal responsibilities to respect human rights, I think that investors also understand the need for robust and resilient supply chains, which are predicated in part on healthy and stable workforces. And that has become even more obvious uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Related to that, investors are increasingly recognizing how human rights violations and poor working conditions in global supply chains reflect poor company practices and raise flags for them generally about corporate governance and other issues that they are watching in, in their companies. Um, to give you one example, the uh, Platform on Living Wage Financials, which is an investor coalition that brings together um, financial institutions worth almost 5 trillion uh, euros in assets. Those members call on the companies um, to move towards a living wage for workers in their global supply chains, including in uh, garment and footwear sectors, precisely because living wage is a right that enables other human rights in the supply chain and it helps workers out of poverty. Um, so, you know, that's just one example of in investors taking a sector wide approach to a systemic problem um, and an example of investors understanding and acting on their role as stewards of capital in ways that I think can ultimately help address fundamental human rights issues. Um, and I would just say, finally, since we are in this environment where you know, there's a, a number of emerging laws around human rights due diligence, investor support for that um, uh, movement towards mandatory human rights due diligence is I think another indication of, um, of investors realization that the voluntary initiatives are not working. Um, just a few months ago, 94 investors urged the EU to pass uh, mandatory human rights, environmental and due diligence legislation. So I think that, you know, a lot of the pieces are there for investors to be a really important actor in this um, new model. Thanks, Liz. Um, that was good to understand the amount of uh, money behind uh, institutional investors and the power that they uh, hold and especially their support, you know, the growing support around mandatory due diligence. I wanted to turn, um, we are uh, have uh, 20 more minutes, but I wanted just to turn towards Calpona one more time, um, just because last year uh, Industrial and its affiliates established a, a experts working group. Um, part of the work was to have uh, Cornell do the research for us to examine the impacts of the COVID pandemic and the lack of social protection. Um, so Kelpona, can you maybe briefly discuss some of the recommendations and outcomes that the expert uh, group has been uh, working on? Sure, yeah, thank you, Christina. But, you know, it was really uh, interesting to hear uh, Liz's, uh, you know, perspectives and what the investor is looking at is really a good sign because this is what you know the investors need to do. So hope you know coming days will we achieve some good thing. Okay, so what uh, you know the, in the industrial we affiliates are working on, I think we started speaking on this in middle of 2020, uh, when uh, you know when uh, the pandemic was like past half a year, and we have seen that thousands of workers uh, are lost their job uh, in 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 during this pandemic and without getting their unpaid wages. So, you know, that took to have a uh, expert committee within our industrial global union, which we had middle of last year. And uh, we started speaking on the social protection, like many, many of our countries doesn't have that. And we, uh, we need to hold our workers back. So the discussion, uh, you know, we ended up um, to scratching something that we call now that the brands are, are responsible to pay the unpaid wages. I know that, you know, uh, it here, when we talk about that, it sounds that there is a lot of workers, works need to do, because we need to get all the data of the workers who didn't get paid and who is the responsible. And the way we want it, it is little, I mean, not fully worked yet, but the brand will be contributing manufacturers will be contributing and we definitely looking forward for enforceable agreement around these unpaid wages. So uh, the strategy is uh, so for now that uh, we have, 
uh, you know, definitely, you know, documenting all these. So we have a draft document. I think, uh, you know, coming days we'll be making uh, it more clear. And then we'll be run workshops uh, in, in, in the region, uh, you know, the global workshop that can be like online or offline. And then uh, we'll be doing regional workshops in MENA and Asia Pacific regions, and then brand outreach, identifying key brands, uh, and also, you know, identifying at least 10 brands whom we will we'll be reached out to. So, you know, I'm not giving uh, full information on it because we are still working on it, but the idea is to get the unpaid wages and idea is to have a enforceable agreement around this area uh, by naming of social protection. And from there, we can extend our work in, in, in the affiliated countries, in the production countries, to have a full social protection uh, for our members and our workers. And I think, uh, I mean, we are all are planning together to during this uh, Women's Day to raise our voice, uh, you know, around this uh, social protection. Uh, this is the time because if we don't speak for ourselves, no one will. Yes, no, I think, you know, the sector is predominantly uh, women workers um, and to gain political leverage, you know, we do need to raise our voices collectively um, and to uh, demand uh, a seat at the table and to negotiate. I wanted to um, maybe just turn to Ruin lastly, because, you know, in addition to the, um, uh, agreement that you have, you also have a convention. So how does that help in this whole process? What is the role of the ILO Maritime Convention in these negotiations? Yeah, thanks again, Christina. So so I think um, it, it, it's interesting that you asked this question in the sense that I think the um, mature industrial relations in the sector at the global level between the ITF and uh, maritime employers and their industry associations actually helped uh, helped us achieve, uh, helped us get the, the Maritime Labor Convention in 2006. Um, and that level of social partnership is probably the reason why um, since um, the ILO began um, creating international labor standards that we had almost 70 instruments uh, relating to the shipping industry, which is, which is you know, uh, quite a large number. So the Maritime Labor Convention essentially um, brings all those instruments together under one umbrella. Um, and what it does is really do, um, I think, um, several key things. Obviously set minimum standards for um, uh, employment standards for seafarers. Second thing is to set up an inspection regime um, uh, for workers who call at whatever port in the world where the, where, where the state has ratified the um, convention and provide for significant um, uh, remedies for workers um, faced by sudden changes in the industry. For example, um, there's provisions for financial security for seafarers who have been abandoned uh, by the employer. So an abandonment, um, among other things, has been defined as you know, not being paid your wages for, for, for four months. So once that happens, this financial security system kicks in and the state is obligated to pay the seafarers that amount, right? So it has all of those things. Um, and, what, uh, and it also has, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this inbuilt mechanism that, of course, states um, through whatever means have autonomy in setting the minimum wage fixing machinery for seafarers, but that, that the, the level of pay for the entry level seafarers should not be below that negotiated by the social partners of the ILO. And that's codified in the instrument itself. So the MLC, um, I would say certainly helps in many of those aspects because we have, um, an international labor standard representing the highest form of international law in this space, setting very clear minimum standards below which we cannot go. So we can we do not have employers saying, okay, we're gonna try and negotiate below that. Absolutely not. Um, it also um, helps us um, uh, again, in terms of driving up standards. So that is um, creating a fair, fair competition and a level playing field for um, uh, all shipping companies and indeed, um, flag states 
So these are the, 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 the shipping registries. So, so I think there is a very good symbiotic relationship with the, with the collective bargaining processes that build on the convention. And I think the convention is also unique in the sense that while it doesn't place direct obligations on companies, it pretty much does that, <laughs> right? By, by requiring ship owners to do a whole host of things, including um, on you know, what, the, um, what, the, what the living quarters of a vessel should look like what facilities should be there. So it's very much targeted towards that. And we also have this model replicated in the fishing sector where we have convention 188 on work in fishing, which kind of mirrors the maritime labor convention showing that it can also be replicated in other sectors. So those kind of conventions are just not only for uh, maritime workers, but you know I think it's important for us to recognize that these instruments are ways that uh, workers in, for example, in the textile and garment sector uh, could uh, have a way and a voice to work with lead brands and global uh, retailers on uh, you know, sound, mature industrial relations, which many brands you know, who have signed the uh, international accord or who have global framework agreements with industrial uh, are trying to drive the sector towards that. So I think um, there are uh, good actors in the field in this sector as well. So, um, and then finally, I'm gonna uh, just give one last question to Liz. Um, you know, we've been talking about this model and how we could work on, you know, uh, the severance issue, which has been, you know, a lot of wage theft that we've seen, but also to build out, you know, forms of social protection. Do you think that's something that resonates with investors or how do you see the role of investors in that, in the work that we're about, to, we are embarking on? Yeah, thanks, Christina. So going back to the, the basics, the ILO call to action, um, which came out in the, at the beginning or, or right in the middle of the pandemic, um, in that call to action, uh, all players, including financial institutions, were called on to participate in strengthening worker protection systems, um, especially in the wake of COVID. And that includes institutional investors. And so we envision investors playing a key role in any social protection initiative. Um, as I started out in my first um, response saying that they, they play an important leverage role on brands to uphold corporate responsibility to respect supply chain worker rights. And um, large investors have actually already started down this path during the pandemic uh, in some ways. There are investor coalitions right now urging multinational corporations to take measures that I think we can say are broadly related to social protection. For example, pressure on multinationals to pay, uh, to provide paid sick leave to all workers, including subcontracted workers, um, and in expressing concern for the lack of social safety nets. So, uh, you know, that's, again, it's already on um, investors' radar, um, and we've seen investors expressing concern in the face of wage theft um, and lack of severance, as Calpona has, has, uh, has talked about. One reason that these institutional investors focus on these, these issues is because as what we call universal owners, you know, these large investors that own kind of a piece of, of the market all across, um, all across the market, they are affected by systemic problems like the shutdown of global supply chains, like widespread layoffs leading to deepening poverty for large swaths of the population. And uh, social protection is a societal issue. You know, it, it affects entire economies, it affects political stability and therefore capital markets. Um, so it's an internationally recognized human right, but it's also an essential element of social and market stability and a resilient garment sector in particular. And I think that resonates um, a lot with, uh, particularly with these um, institutional investors who are universal owners. Um, Investors are increasingly understanding that company practices and entire business models are not only associated with particular human rights violations in a particular place, but that they're also contributing to systemic problems like inequality. And we're seeing a lot of, um, of investors picking up on this point. Um, on, the, on the positive side, contributing to social protection, 
is an opportunity for companies to address some of the negative impacts of supply chain outsourcing, and I think should therefore be part of investor demand. Um, and, you know, in addition, there are, are gender and racial equality and child labor angles of social protection, um, you know, lots of issues that already resonate with uh, investors as well. And uh, I mean, the ITUC has done research on this and has pointed out that countries with the highest level of equality have universal social protection systems. So, um, you know, we're, we're aiming ultimately to work with investors so that they can gain an understanding of and an ability to make the case for universal social protection as being in part a responsibility of businesses that are benefiting from uh, global supply chain production. So specifically, we're hoping to enlist investors to bring leverage to bear on, uh, you know, for example, companies that refuse to recognize this responsibility. And I would just say that in our capital strategies work over the years, the investors have been increasingly helpful in pushing companies to the table for dialogue. And that's really key here. Um, you know, the trade unions want dialogue. They don't want to fight with the brands. They want to, you know, push this forward. And I think that's, you know, a, a really important role for investors. And, you know, as you've pointed out, Christina, this is long-term work. We are building the case for social protection as part of a, of changing the textile and garment industry. We're building the case for the role of brands in contributing to social protection as part of a resilient industry and sustainable society and, and healthy and resilient workforces. And we are leveraging the role of in investors in influencing the brands so that all the pieces kind of fit together. Yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces in this. As we know in the global trade union movement, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of um, different pieces. I wanted, we have a few minutes and I wanted to see if there were any questions to our panelists um, from our uh, participants. So if you would like to ask a question, uh, please, you know, raise your hand. You have the little hand button. No questions? Well, I do see, oh, David, go ahead. David from Workers United. Yeah. In the US. Hi, uh, and thank you. Very, very excellent presentations by all. Um, Liz, I had um, one question for you in your work with investors. What, what, what do you see the role of um, not just organizations, uh, union organizations like Industrial, but um, NGOs in like the Clean Clothes Campaign and pressuring um, investors and pressuring um, companies that uh, work in the apparel sector to have much better standards for how they treat their workers who produce their products? Well, a couple of things. One, um, the NGOs are working on gathering the data and looking at what's going on on the ground. And that is really key information for investors. Um, there's, there's a lot of controversy about, um, you know, investors not being able to get the kind of data or information that they need simply talking to companies or simply talking to uh, other industry associations. So NGOs have a role, I think, in, um, uh, in, in gathering that data and in working directly um, with, uh, with unions and with others on the ground. Um, so, uh, you know, investors don't turn only to trade unions, they're turning increasingly to, um, to civil society organizations as well. Um, and I think, you know, awareness raising and campaigning around these issues like wage theft, there's been a lot of research put out by a number of civil society organizations um, that has been really helpful in making this case about just the, the extent of wage theft, you know, going back to what Kalpona was talking about, the impact on individual workers' lives and the impact on, you know, really large swaths of, of society um, that's that's part of it. And industrial works with um, with civil society allies as well in bringing this um, information to bear um, to uh, to investors. Yeah, no, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for the panelists? Edgar. 
Yeah, I You're probably, on mute. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm okay. You hear me now? Okay, Elizabeth, there's a follow-up to that, and I apologize I joined a little late, but I appreciated your presentation. One of the things that Christina had mentioned is that there's this move towards you know, trying to create a, a severance fund for workers who obviously have gotten, uh, you know, have, have, have had difficulty paid when companies either go out of business or stiff them or whatever. Do you see in terms of in, investors, uh, do you see it being a reality that investors will make a demand, you know, uh, on, on companies that they should Want to work towards creating, you know, some type of severance fund so workers would be able to uh, receive compensation for the work that they have done. I mean, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, uh, I think part of it is that we need to bring this um, this issue to investors. We have a lot of. Um, building blocks to put in place as well with investors. I don't think it's, you know, we flip a switch and and uh, it'll be automatic. I think it's it's making the case, it's bringing examples um, like what the one that Ruen has talked about, um, bringing the research as, as Jason has talked about, you know, what are the different models? What are things that work? Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that there is, uh, you know, investor support, for example, for living wage, which I put out there is, you know, somewhat similar kind of issue in that a few years ago, nobody wanted to touch that, you know, with a 10 foot pole. And now you have investor groups actually pushing for that um, in part because it's a rights issue and in part because it's a, sort of a, a, a larger societal issue. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily a smooth path, but I think that there are ways in which we can make this case. Uh, there are a lot of messages that we can bring to investors, examples that we can bring um, that I think will resonate with them and and help to build support for it. And I Thank think you. we have uh, time for one last question. If not, then I would like to thank all our panelists. Oh, Etienne, I saw that you had our, our affiliate from South Africa. Welcome. Thanks, Christina. And, and thank you to, to everyone for the presentation. Just quickly um, mention what I, what I put in the chat. Um, you know, I, I really like what, what Ruan has shared with us, the, the the, the way that the international, the, the, the Global Union Federation uses its power and leverage to, to negotiate this, this, this minimum um, at an at a, at a international level and then creates the space for the, for the national unions to go in and negotiate improvements on that. And, and, and the reason I like it because it empowers workers and it empowers those trade unions at the national level to, to um, uh, you know, it becomes an organizing tool, it becomes a, a tool to, to, to build stronger unions and so on. And so, so I think in whatever, as industrial, whatever we, we put in, we, we need to take that into account to make sure that it's, it's not just that we all depend on yourselves, you know, uh, uh, at the international level to, 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 to do the work, but, but that it's also a tool to build trade unions at the national level. Thank you. No, I'm really happy that you uh, spoke up on that. I saw it in the chat and I think that's, you know, very key um, that it's just not the brands that have to do this or it's not just the suppliers, but it's creating that space for national uh, trade union federations to do their proper job. And, you know, in South Africa, you, you know, have the benefit that you have industry-wide bargaining and, you know, as a political uh, position for industrial. This is what we've been trying to, you know, we continue to uh, work towards in other production countries. So I see all these pieces developing and, you know, this idea of getting like a framework that has a binding nature that sets a floor that uh, our national affiliates can then use to uh, work with their own uh, employer associations and do the negotiations that's you know in the spirit of uh, our strategic goals in the sector. So thank you for that comment. So we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank all our panelists and the questions that we've received. And you know, uh, there's strength for all of us in this uh, long fight. But I think you know when there's the political will, um, which the trade unions uh, have, and we have you know member company brands who also want to find a way to. Uh, do their due diligence and improve the supply chain that these blocks are, uh, you know, slowly, uh, not slowly, I would say 
moving forward in trying to find this new industrial relations model. And I think we have all the ingredients and I want just to thank everyone uh, for their participation.